Good afternoon, everyone. I am Ege Dündar. Thanks for joining us today. I'm a writer and activist and board member of Penn International, the world's largest association of writers, dedicated to promoting literature and defending freedom of expression. Welcome to this event for the publication of War, Censorship and Prosecution, Penn International's case list for 2023 and 2024. The case list documents 122 cases of writers facing harassment, arrest, violence, and even death worldwide. For over a century, Penn International has monitored and advocated for writers who have suffered repression, for their right to write freely and to comment on the world around them without fear or repercussion. Penn International's case list is a yearly document of violations against writers, what happened, where and by whom. It covers writers of fiction and non-fiction, journalists, academics, poets, playwrights, songwriters and translators, anyone who works with the written word. It's a powerful reminder of the risks faced by writers around the world for their peaceful expression. Without the right to expression, we can't know if the other rights are functional. Writers, like to town criers, are often the first to sound the alarm on problematic issues in their societies. The prosecution and loss of peaceful and caring people should bring us together over supporting them, to stand up for values that we all share. Not because they are unique, but because they are emblematic of what happens to those speaking truth to power. Autocratic forces collaborate on strategies of censorship. As we share similar threats into the future, from wealth inequality to migration, climate change to free expression, we should consolidate our collective efforts beyond political, economic and ideological divides to ensure that the voices of our colleagues and friends will not be easily silenced, nor will we. My father, a writer and journalist from Turkey, was prosecuted unfairly and he futures in the case list. When we were isolated, slandered and prosecuted by brutal state power, the Global Pen family stood with us and I'm ever thankful for them showing solidarity in practical ways as we try to rebuild our lives. After seven years at Pen International, I have a strong sense of how this solidarity works. I'm deeply aware of the painstaking research and advocacy work that goes into it and I could not be more proud of my colleagues who work to reach out to uh, our other colleagues at risk, amplify their voices and follow up with them for years to come. If I feel safe and strong today, it's because of them, and I thank them from the bottom of my heart for their efforts. Today marks World Poetry Day. Several persecuted poets feature in the case list, including Innocent Bahati from Rwanda. Let us open this event with his empty chair. Innocent Bahati is a young, popular Rwandan poet known for his opening critical expression on social issues. Bahati has been missing since 7 February 2021, after he reportedly went for a dinner meeting with an unnamed person at a hotel in Nyanza district in the southeastern province of Rwanda. We did not return to Kigali, as expected. His associates tried to reach him by phone that evening, but found that Bahati's phone was turned off. After two days of trying to establish his whereabouts, his disappearance was reported to the Rwanda Investigations Bureau. Its spokesperson denied that the agency was holding him, that investigations were ongoing and that no information would be revealed at the time. In 2017, Innocent Bahati had similarly disappeared after he made a poetic post on Facebook only to reappear in police custody. Although he was not charged for any offense, he was sent to prison without trial and freed after three months following a court order. Penn International believes that Innocent Bahati's disappearance is in relation to his critical poetry and critical expression on issues affecting Rwandan society. Penn International urges the Rwandan authorities to ensure his safety and his well-being. Today, we will hear from four panelists who will speak to the issues and writers featured in the case list, starting with Matida, writer, activist and chair of Penn International's Writers and Prison Committee, Fatina Algora, Palestinian poet, Tania Bruguera, Cuban artist, author and academic, and Marko Vidojkovic, Serbian writer and journalist. The case list is a powerful reminder of the risks faced by writers around the world for their peaceful expression. A few ground rules before we start. This event will be recorded and later uploaded onto Penn International social media channels. We will hear from our four speakers, followed by a Q&A session. Participants will be muted, but I invite you to go into the Q&A function and add your comments and questions for the end. So I will start by introducing our first speaker. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Matida, Chair of Penn International's Writers in Prison Committee. 
In 1993, Tida was arrested by the repressive military regime of Myanmar on charges of endangering peace, having contact with illegal organizations and distributing unlawful literature. She served six years in insane prison. As founder and former president of PEN Myanmar, Tida has played a key role advocating for human rights in Myanmar and globally. Following the 2021 coup in Myanmar, poets and writers have been at the forefront of the resistance to junta rule with many persecuted for their writing and activism. Welcome, dear Tida. I want to ask you, why has poetry come to symbolize dissent to military rule in Myanmar? And why does the junta view poets and writers as such a threat? Well, yeah, in my country, it has been a very long tradition to having a literary talks. And at every literary talks, people would like to listen to reciting poems, poetry, something like that, because the, the, we do have a very uh, different way of uh, presenting poetry. It's not just the rhyme and rhythm, but also the modern poetry, so many poetry. So poetry is pretty much like our ground understanding of what's happening in the deeper part of the society. You know, it reflects our daily life, it reflects our history, it reflects our way of thinking, it reflects our hunger for freedom, it reflects everything, something like that. So that's why it's pretty much uh, influential i might say so that's why the role of the poetry and writers it has been pretty much very important throughout these days in order to uh looking for the freedom of expression the freedom so it's a creativity it's for us throughout these censorship years five decades it's not just the the, the creativity is not just looking for freedom, but also the way how we practice our freedom, the way how we use our integrated freedom to finding the best way to got publication, something like that. So that's why I think the, the, the uh, whole society, it's very much uh, more progressive, more, uh, responsive and sensitive to all these political situation inside the country. For that reason, as soon as the coup happened and most of the writers and poets, they taking part so intensely, immensely and very uh, publicly because of their influence, a lot of the local uh, populations also stood up together with them, something like that. So for that reason, the throughout our history, the military, the consecutive military regimes has been pretty much targeting the writers and poets and the uh, the one who express freely are as their enemies. I see. So you're saying that in a sense, they are emblematic for what society at large experiences. Yes. Thank you, Tida. I really appreciate that. Um, before we will have time for questions um, at the end for each speaker. Um, so we will leave that to there. You can log your questions in the Q&A section below. Um, and we will then move on to um, introducing Fatina Algora. Um, the situation in the occupied Palestinian territories and Israel has slipped into unprecedented levels of violence where harrowing violations of international humanitarian law have been committed and unparalleled human suffering has been mounting since Hamas's 7th of October attack on southern Israel. Among those who were killed, a staggering number of at least 14 writers and poets lost their lives in less than four months, alongside with 30,000 other people, marking the deadliest conflict for writers in recent history as well. Um, Fatina Algora is a Palestinian poet, journalist, translator, and member of Pan Flanders, who survived the war in Gaza. Fatina translated poetry from Dutch into Arabic for various literary projects, including Fatina's Poetry Salon, which she hosts in the Netherlands and Belgium. Dear Fatina, welcome and thanks for being with us today. The... Thank you. For... Right. Thank you, uh, Egg, for uh, inviting me today. Thank you for Penn International for inviting me today and for all the, the members here and the people who's watching this uh, podcast or 
channel. Uh, well, actually, it it's it wasn't uh, the 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 challenges that we face uh, writers face in in Palestine, specifically in Gaza Strip. It's not uh, a recent thing. It's begun since the occupation. Actually, since uh, since they occupied the uh, uh, Palestine uh, nineteen forty eight. Since uh, and even before that, when uh, we had the Haganah uh, uh, gangs and. Uh, they killed uh, poets. They killed singers who who used to to sing and and to 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 to, to tell uh, uh, pa Palestinian uh, songs to encourage people. That was before even uh, the occupation uh, during um, the uh, um, British uh, uh, occupation. So it's not a recent thing, and uh, it's not after a seventh of. October because Israel didn't occupy Palestine seventh uh, of October. It's gone going on um, a, procedure, a procedure actually to prevent us. So if we want to talk about exactly what we need as writers in Palestine or all the writers, if we want just to to to, to make just a small lines about what we need to, to have what to, uh, as, as writers. First of all, we need the safe opportunity to present uh, our creativity to uh, um, specific uh, audience. Uh, this is once. Uh, and this, we don't have it in Palestine. And if we have it, there is so many risks uh, that uh, something will happen and to cancel the events. So, or uh, you don't, you cannot be able to go to attend uh, to that event. Uh, second of all, the movement that usually occurs in the cultural community leads to the development of this sense. And this is, we don't have, because normally, um, with, when you when you write read this, uh, write something or you make uh, like creative uh, art or something you need to present it to people and for the people in Gaza, they only have Gaza to present their work there. You don't have the luxury even to go to West Bank or Ramallah. So there is no movement happens here between writers, between the audience and the writers. So the people there they are ignorant about what's going on in the cultural field, especially in Gaza, I'm talking right now, because also I'm from Gaza. Uh, that's why I'm also um, talking about it. And also about uh, printing and publishing, which enable uh, enables the creator to obtain uh, appreciation and recognition from um, for himself and his work. And this also has to lead to, to do with the events, the movement and um, uh, being together uh, also the cultural contact with the multiple uh, culturals with, which leads also to uh, the openness of creativity to a new space. So we are talking about all of these points leads to a better uh, cultural uh, society, which we don't have, we are prevented to do all of this th these things. The, uh, the creators or the cultural uh, uh, society in Gaza, it's it's like Gaza, it's in a siege, in a, in a prison. So they read each other, they saw it, it uh, go to their uh, each other um, occasions or um, uh, uh, book fairs, even small big book fairs, because in Gaza you don't see book fairs. At, for, for instance, you have it in Ramallah, but you don't have it in Gaza. You have to encourage these people to go out at least have how many times we received invitations to go abroad to a festival, to be part of a, in a festival in uh, outside of Palestine. And I was one of the people who uh, were prevented so many times uh, and to, to go uh, outside for uh, poetry uh, evening or uh, events. So <laughs> you are locked in side this society what shall we do i think um we need to be more related to the what's going on 
for real. We don't need to count on the, the names that we know already, and it's already established names with uh, names with the history. Some of them, lots of them, especially when we are talking about people who's older. I'm not against old, of course. I'm, I'm getting old, all of us. But I mean, we don't see the role of the youth, the real youth in the movement of this. And this happens if we give them more support, more platforms to be here, to be seen. To, to, so this is what we need to do to, to, to the people. We need to make at least um, like, um, I don't know, like a map of writers and uh, creators in, in, in Palestine, especially in Gaza, because they don't have these canals. So at least we have to, 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 to uh, make like connection with a few of a few, a few numbers or writers or uh, painters or filmmakers. And we have plenty of them in, in Gaza and in Palestine. So at least to contact the new generations, to hear their voices, and also to not fall in, fall in this trap where everything comes from Palestine should be um, uh, fine art or and and something remarkable no we need also because this is we heard the literature and the the um the the the, the, art, the palestinian art and literature we need to give it its um what it deserve for a critic i mean like do not accept all uh, anyone who send you like uh, poems or because these people maybe they don't write real poem they just write like their emotions and we all know uh, poetry is more than in emotions i'm not i'm talking more about poetry but i'm i mean all uh what uh we we create in in, in palestine it's 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 a huge topic actually to be answered in, a, in 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 five minutes. But I try to focus on just what these people need and they don't have actually in the reality, and how we could make like a link, a bridge between us and them to let them be heard and seen uh, more than before. Thank you so much. Yes, it's very difficult to shorten this topic into five minutes, but I think your points are very important, especially for underrepresented voices, because we do focus on the goldfish effect, as they yes. say, one big case, you just support them and it's all okay. But actually, those younger and less known need even more help. So Exactly. And there, they, there is more creative, actually, and very unique voices in these new voices and in, in these new generations than the old one. So we need them to enrich our cultural uh, scene, actually. Absolutely, thank you. And there might be a lot of questions later to follow up on, on your point. Um, I will just quickly move on on our list to Cuba. And um, Cuba sadly has the highest number of artists in the Americas region imprisoned or otherwise persecuted for their artistic freedom. There are no guarantees of due process and there's no independent legal defense. Many writers have left the country uh, believing that it offers them the only means of freedom to continue with their art. I am very pleased to introduce Tania Bruguera. Is a, he, she's a renowned multidisciplinary artist and author, currently a senior lecturer and affiliate faculty at Hartford University, Harvard University. Bruguera is the founder and director of the Hannah Arendt Institute of Artivism, INSTAR. Um, Bruguera is the author of several books, including The Francis Effect, Tania Bruguera, Let Truth Be, Though the World Perish, Tanya Bruguera in conversation with Claire Bishop. Tanya also features in our case lists. Welcome, dear Tanya. Can you please share some more information about the censorship faced by writers and artists in Cuba? In this year's installment of the case list, Cuba is the country with the highest number of threats in the Americas, together with Nicaragua. Please tell us more about the crisis facing the American continent, specifically in your country. Well, thank you so much for inviting me and to be with such an amazing group of people. I think in the Americas, and I will include the United States as well, um, there is a very critical moment for censorship. Um, 
in Latin America, there have been um, huge persecutions to journalists and writers and artists. And the main case has, seen, has been Nicaragua, where the majority of Pen Nicaragua members had to leave the country forcefully. And um, the 222 um, prisoners were forced to leave the country, but also they took away their nationality, making them de facto uh, people without, uh, you know, displaced, but without any country, uh, stateless people. So basically, um, they have been, um, this has been one of the most um, 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 intense examples, but also um, I want to quickly, before I go to Cuba, talk about the culture council, the council culture and the bans and how governments are using cancel culture, which originally was made to, let's say, like correct some of the people who have been doing awful things and question um, how come, if they have right or not to their work or to distribute the work. And what many governments are doing is using the culture, um, the cancel culture for dissidents pretending they are doing something they are not doing or offending in things they are not offending as a way to legitimize their censorship uh, internationally. So in the United States, I just want to very quickly say that it's been um, a massive censorship of books, particularly the ones for schools where they address LGBTQ plus issues. And also I have to say that in universities and also in general in the culture, a sphere in the United States talking about Palestine has become extremely censored. Um, I can do examples of uh, collectors who, that return the work of artists because they have signed a letter in, a, in defense of Palestine or in support. Um, the market for artists has been brutal, like taking some artists price really low as a punishment or uh, taking them out of the market altogether. So I think um, in universities as well, like professors are advised not to talk about the issue, not to engage in these discussions. And, you know, Harvard, for example, is one of those examples that our president was forced to leave uh, due to Palestine issues. So in, in case of Cuba, I want to, to address three quick uh, elements first. The political prisoners, we have um, uh, thousands of uh, political prisoners, including journalists, artists, and um, activists in general. We have done everything possible to liberate them. The government doesn't care. So we don't know what else to do. So we feel in a kind of situation where um, they don't care anymore about their public image related to the to the prisoners, and they feel like there is uh, they are being used for exchange, you know. So they put a price on their heads. The other thing I wanted to talk is the lack of solidarity with what happened with Cuba. I understand that Cuba was uh, sixty five years ago um, a place where people can put their hope about a better society a place where uh, things will be corrected, no racism, no classism, not, you know, all of these utopias were going to be made. Unfortunately, 65 years later, this is not the case. We have a corrupt uh, government. Uh, recently, the minister of, uh, of economy was uh, put in prison because he was bringing to the United States uh, millions of dollars illegally from his corruption. So we have a corrupt government, we have an inept, inept government, and we have a government that doesn't care about people at all. So this is a problem we are facing because when a writer writes a book critical about Cuba, an artist do an exhibition with some elements critical about what is happening now in Cuba, we have the people who should be our allies, the people we defend, you know, are not defending us because we are offending them, let's say, because we're saying the reality that is happening in Cuba and it doesn't correspond with the image they have of what Cuba is, which is 65 years ago. So I think this is a very critical element because a lot of artists um, see, feel abandoned, feel they're fighting alone against everybody, the government plus the other people. 
especially now when um, more than 70% of the artists left the country in, in the time of two years. Um, now they live abroad and they have this conflict as well. And the last element I want to talk is the tentacles of the Cuban government outside of Cuba. And this might go also for the Nicaraguan, I mean, I assume um, they expel you, they force you to exile, they put you in a precarious situation because many of the artists who were forced to, to leave the country are now in an illegal situation in Europe. And um, this is, of course, putting them in a very, very vulnerable situation. And uh, what happened is that the Cuban government is not only satisfied that they get rid of you, therefore there is no more pressure internally for them. They can discredit what you do because you don't live there. So therefore you don't have the authorized voice, but actually they are making sure that the artists, the journalists, the writers do not have any professional um, development. And that has been uh, completely, I mean, we have examples, we have uh, case studies of the Cuban government intervening in, uh, um, in book fairs to tell the, the organizers to disinvite certain artists, certain writers. We have cases, studies of uh, cinema festivals where they have talked to the organizer to disinvite or forbid anybody who is an independent um, filmmaker to be part of the festival. And they and I am one of the people that for three occasions, the Cuban government had made sure that or, or try that I'm not participating in the event. The last one was last uh, two weeks ago. I had a show in Malta, it's a Biennale, and the ambassador of Cuba, who is in Rome, traveled to Malta to make sure that I was disinvited. And they even brought a list of uh, pro-government artists to invite instead of me. So this is also very complex because it's not so well known. Uh, people think that they expel you and that's it. No, they expel you and they keep making your life extremely difficult and um, disinviting you, but also spreading fake uh, news or fake information about yourself, of you. So people don't don't work with you and so on. So I think those are the elements. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tanya. That was a very compelling picture of what's going on. And as I listen to our speakers, I'm also realizing that what you say, governments don't care, is true for all of us. That they work across borders to silence us is true for all of us. Doesn't matter which country, but the tactics they employ are uh, the same. So we need to also come up with resolutions and we can discuss that in the question section, perhaps. Just before um, moving on to Serbia, um, uh, I would like to um, introduce our next speaker, Marka, Marko Bidojkovic. In October 2023, Penn International published a report entitled Toxic Narrative Silencing Expression in the Western Balkans which documents the myriad threats and harassments faced by independent journalists, writers and activists in Serbia, one of the most dangerous places in Europe outside of Ukraine to work as a journalist. Marko Vidojkovic is a writer and journalist, TV host from Serbia, who regularly comments on political and societal issues, including in his podcast The Good, The Bad and The Evil. His dystopian novel Diubre, Trash, focuses on corruption and attracted the ire of pro-government media and members of the public. Marko Vidojkovic had to relocate from Serbia in 2023 after receiving a series of death threats. His case features in the case list. Welcome, dear Marko. How is your case emblematic of the shocking threats and harassments faced by independent voices in Serbia? And what can international organizations such as Penn International do to help address the situation? Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, well, my case is uh, typical, uh, uh, maybe a bit extreme, uh, because uh, it ended with, uh, well, it didn't end yet, but uh, uh, it ended with relocation. During the last year, uh, uh, my wife and I uh, were uh, nine months abroad. Uh, then, we get back, then we got back to Serbia because we had the elections in uh, December of for 2023 and we are awaiting new elections because the previous elections were rigged so the new elections are on june the 2nd of 2024 and uh, the regime is at their best at this point 
because uh, uh, before the elections they uh, uh, well they do not go uh, uh, into uh, complete violence uh, as they as they uh, can so I uh, decided of course uh, with uh, uh, co after consulting with uh, friends from Penn International and other organizations to uh, come back uh, temporarily and maybe uh, we will see what will happen after the June the 2nd because uh, uh, well to cut things short I will uh, first of all uh, uh, you know uh, let me describe you a typical method use for retaliation against those who dare to criticize uh, the regime in Serbia and trust me uh, every public personality is uh, no public personality is spared from this uh, and I, I'm sure that uh, this will sound uh, uh, familiar uh, because it's it's from autocracy to the autocracy it's pretty much uh, the same but here is uh, what it is like here so it starts uh, with the smearing and the threatening campaign uh, coming from either high ranking regime officials or regime control media, often both, uh, against the targeted person. So let, let's call that person from now on the target. Uh, and do have in mind that 90% of media, or maybe even more, of all media in Serbia are regime controlled. So uh, such campaign starts viciously at the same time uh, with identical texts uh, in all media outlets. And uh, this campaign could, la uh, could, could last uh, up to seven days or even more. So imagine uh, that uh, you hear your name uh, day from, uh, after day and after day for seven days. And of course, uh, uh, this uh, uh, campaign is followed by the swarm of online uh, insults and threats, you know, hundreds, even thousands in some cases, uh, depending of how vicious the campaign is. And then uh, that is followed by verbal and physical attacks uh, on the street. So all this being encouraged by corrupted judiciary, uh, which does close to nothing uh, to protect the target. Uh, during this organized attack, the, the only protection the target has is uh, not leaving their apartment. Now, if such campaigns happen often against the same target, which was my case, uh, I had like certainly more than 10 uh, huge campaigns, several day campaigns in a period of uh, less than a year and a half during uh, 2021 and 2022. Uh, well, then even uh, uh, when uh, the campaign stops it's not safe anymore you know you're not the target anymore you become the prey and uh, uh, you uh, are a possible victim of attacks uh, of random attacks or organized attacks we don't know which is which on the streets and of course these attacks will stay unpunished or maybe uh, even worse punished by a least possible sentence uh, so uh, let me, uh, you know, go through uh, uh, this perfectly organized uh, network of terror. It consists of, as I said before, uh, high ranking government officials, uh, pro regime media or regime control media, which in Serbia is the same, uh, far right extremist groups, which are also controlled by the regime. Uh, then sports hooligans, which are also controlled by the regime, and of course hundreds of thousands of members uh, of the ruling uh, Serbian Progressive Party, uh, out of which tens of thousands are active internet trolls. Uh, something like uh, we have a, a similar troll farm as uh, in uh, as it was of late uh, Prigozhin in uh, Russia. Uh, so uh, you know all this. Is sheltered once again by totally corrupted judiciary. Uh, you know, uh, everything, uh, uh, the situation in Serbia uh, seems uh, most likely, uh, it really reminds uh, uh, us uh, in the, to, to the situation in Russia. But Serbia is still the candidate for European Union and is surrounded by uh, other candidates or members of European Union. So, uh, 
I, I really cannot uh, uh, tell why, but uh, this terror lasts for 10 years. For the last four years, it really got worse and worse. And it was, you know, the international community was turning the blind eye. I really, I can go now into reasons why uh, they called this uh, 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 government the stabilocracy, you know, uh, like eight years ago. So stabilocracy turned into autocracy, of course. Uh, and uh, in this, what I uh, described just now is not, uh, uh, you know, the only, but it's it's typical. It's what waits everybody who, who dares to speak against the regime in Serbia. Of course, there are slap suits. I, I collected three of them, all from uh, one uh, high uh, uh, ranking uh, government official. Uh, and uh, these are the uh, lawsuits I am aware of, because in Serbia uh, you can uh, be on trial and not know about it, but uh, only w uh, find out about it uh, when the sentence is out and when you need to uh, pay the emotional damage to some, uh, you know, uh, poor uh, regime soul. Uh, so, you know, having in mind uh, the publicity and the awareness, awareness and the, is that coming from international organizations. And I would really much to thank uh, PEN International, which starting from, 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 from my case, it was uh, in January 2023, really paid close attention on what's going on, not just in Serbia, but also Western Balkans, because, you know, uh, Serbia is the largest country, Western Balkans, with pretty close ties with Russia. And, you know, this, uh, um, it's not good with, uh, when you have this uh, uh, influential autocracy and uh, Serbian minorities all around the, the region. Uh, it really uh, can spill out uh, in several other countries. So we have similar situation in other countries uh, 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 in Western Balkans, but in Serbia, by far the worst. So uh, we are now uh, completely without any uh, protection and without any defense. Uh, we have uh, uh, until June the 2nd uh, uh, the hope to, to maybe something is going to change in local elections in the capital Belgrade but uh, even if it doesn't and uh, the, the chances are that uh, the, the, these elections will be rigged again because this is what this government does. Uh, after that, uh, I, I'm sure that uh, uh, they were closely watching and paying attention to what's going on and who was speaking what, and they're, of course, watching this also as, as we speak. And we don't know what will happen uh, once we don't have, uh, we are not uh, in the campaign for, for the elections. Now, at this point, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, the, the publicity of my case uh, was really helpful uh, for me to to in order for me to get back for a little while and to be prepared to be relocated again if uh, something happens. But you know, I'm I'm one, and there is a lot of us who are in the si similar or exactly the same or even the worst situation than I, than I am right now. So uh, at the end, I need to ask: please keep your eyes on Serbia. And please keep the world informed uh, on uh, what's going on here, because uh, the situation can only get worse at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Marco, for a compelling assessment as well. As you were speaking, I was thinking of Turkey in the back of my head. And really, there's just similar steps, government power, pro-government media, right-wing extremists, same tactics, really. They're all collaborating. Um, before we move on to the questions, um, I would like to thank all the participants. And uh, before, we'd like to share a powerful video produced by Writers Unlimited with the support of Penn International and the Committee to Protect Journalists. And then we will move on to some questions for our panelists.
Yeah, that was a moving video to bring us all into the gravity of the situation of how many people we've lost and how we must work together if we want to ensure that more aren't lost into the future in the same way. Um, I just want to be able to ask you, you have all raised different issues, some with similarities, some with specific country contexts, um, just to address the future and how, what kind of resolutions might we be able to offer to such issues. Um, I first want to start with Matida, just because she's the chair of the Writers in Prison Committee at PEN. Um, uh, Tida, I want to ask you, what can PEN members and supporters do to support writers at risk around the globe? Well, what we are doing right now is the, through the help of the consultation with the individual PEN centers. Uh, PEN Emergency Fund is a one-time grant for those needed is is keep going on for the 2023 we have been supported uh, altogether 74 cases already and uh, we are working on that issue too but it, it's just the for the coverage of the some kind of the uh, support including the relocation we having relocated a couple of the riders from afghanistan already but at the same time, I think the individual pen centers together with the Rider in Prison Committee, we have been working on a couple of other advocacy issue. We have been issuing statements, we uh, issuing the resolution. We also working on the universal periodic review together with the uh, individual pen centers to make it more uh, practical advocacy at the UN level. That's also we are to write, uh, walking right now. And at the same time, uh, our handbook, uh, the, the case list itself, we also use the case list as a ground to make the advocacy. So individual pen centers are also using our case list. This year case list is very, very uh, good for having the overview for the altogether five regions we have been working on. Uh, Americas, Europe, and Central Asia, uh, Asia Pacific, uh, Middle East, and the Northern Africa, and Africa itself. So it's very uh, having the overview of what's going on in order to understand the altogether 122 cases last year in 2023. So compared to 2022, it's a little bit higher number. So it shows the sh shrinkage of the civil so uh, society space and the freedom of expressions all over the world. So I think the individual pen centers also uh, needs to work together in terms of the collective activities together with the Pan International Secretary. So that's very important to having the collective activities. We do have the days of the writer in prisons and some other uh, days for the significant days. We need to have the collective activities from the other Pan centers. And also, uh, we also working on the handbooks for how to uh, make our effort of protection and can be uh, can be feasible something like that so that there will be the some protocol and procedure so it has been the, the handbook has been uh, not updated yet for a couple of years already. So right now, the Rider in Prison Committee is working on uh, improving and uh, re-establishing the new handbook at, in coming annual Congress. So there are so many ways, but the most important thing is uh, we need to keep in solidarity. And as the other uh, panelists said, we need to keep an eye through our individual pen centers. Every uh, members of the Pan International and the individual Pan Center should keep an eye on every uh, very sensitive issues and the areas of our concern. That will be very helpful for us to work on. And we also want to uh, establish the internal communication platform or having more uh, more dates on our calendar. That's our aim for. Uh, in-depth discussions in coming May and your Congress uh, meeting and the September and your Congress. Okay, thank you very much. 
Matida, um, now this is some examples of what we are trying to do, but of course there's much else to be done and often we're good at describing how uh, badly things are going, but we also equally need to offer solutions where we can work towards something. So, um, I, I just have a question for all of you, really. Um, you've all raised different country contexts. Um, I wonder what do you think the international community can and should do to show more solidarity? It's a, more of a part two-part question, because I also want to ask you about youth. Um, we spoke about it in the beginning. Uh, in a sense, your younger peers will be inheriting these situations you find yourselves in. And I would just want to know what would you advise them, younger peers in your circles, to start doing from now for a better future, to start resolving these issues. Maybe we'll try with um, Fatina Algora first, and then I would like to receive all of your answers if possible. Thank you. Fatina, can you hear us? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> I I had a uh, technical problem. Yes. Uh, sorry, I I was busy, so I didn't follow the last uh, sentence. Can you please repeat sure. it again? Of course. Yes, I just wanted to ask a two-part question. What do you think the international community can do against these uh, issues we are facing? And also what you would advise your younger peers um, in your circles to start doing now for an improvement in the future? Oh, it's, again, two big questions. I uh, Actually, I rather um, say about what should I say to, to the younger generation, actually. Uh, don't give up, never give up and dream big and, and do, do not stop resistance, uh, do, do, do not stop arguing, do, do not stop making noises, making, uh, giving people hard time in their minds, do not stop giving the whole world ha hard time. This is what I, I want, be yourself. Don't listen to us. Do not listen to us, to the older people, because we have our ideology. It was fixed ideology. You have your own ideology. This is what I do your life, live your own life. It's what we live, it's not yours. This bagage that we have it, it's not yours, it's ours. So don't live while, while you, you are carrying our bag bagage. This is what I, ca I, I can tell. And I don't know if there's uh, room to talk about the institutes that uh, the occupation destroyed or we, maybe later we can talk about yes, it. Please. No, no, I just uh, part of the question was also how we can, as an international community, support the, um, the issue on going on. So to please stop what's going on, actually, cease fire. Yeah. <laughs> this is the symbol because during uh, this war, the occupation destroy, um, if we want to talk about the historical uh, Gaza, they just destroyed almost 140, uh, 140, 40 uh, building from the old Gaza. Uh, it gave Gaza their, the, the historical face, like Qisariya, uh, Zawiya, uh, Souq Zawiya, Hammam al Samra, uh, Al Basha Balas, and other uh, uh, important places. There is also the most important and and uh, not the most important everything is important re regards what's going on but actually also that they destroyed 26 center a cultural center and theater nine published houses and uh, uh, libraries three uh, uh, inter um uh, um uh, uh, media media uh, pr production uh, companies, um, museums like um, Al Qarara Museum, Rafah Museum, Al Badia Museum, Al Mathaf Museum, Al Basha Museum. Uh, as long as we can talk, I can mention mention so many names that the Israeli destroyed. And since the beginning of this world war, I said that it's a cultural war. So in, in order to stop it, we need actually to be uh, like, to do more effort to, to, for seizing fire now. So that's how we can support and save people there and save the culture even there. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that stark reminder.
um, we need to be more proactive with that, especially our governments, I suppose. Um, and I just want to move on to Tanya and Marco, if you have an answer to the same question, just in terms of uh, the, you know, the problems, how can the international community help and what can young people do? What would be your advice to them taking on these problems? Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm so sorry to hear about, and I agree with you, um, this is a cultural war. And not only in Gaza, but it's also internationally, because the fact that a lot of people cannot talk about it. I was recently in Berlin and I did a project about this and the censorship there is insane. Like, yeah, so solidarity with you. Um, I just want to, I was, I heard once a um, long time ago, um, a repertoire from the UN for cultural affairs that they want, they had this, now it changed. So it's a new person, so it's not their project, but once she said in a meeting that um, they wanted to do something similar that they do with journalists, with artists. I cannot remember the word they call it, but it's basically a protection for certain artists um, um, and, and make it kind of in a legal way, make it protection to them. So if you are trying to kill them or attack them or whatever, like, like Marco was saying before, and it has happened also in Cuba, um, it is something they have to think twice, you know, to go after artists. It might not stop them, but at least because look, they have a journalist and they're killing journalists as well. But I think this is one idea, maybe how to create a certain protection name or, or something for certain artists. Uh, not only that they are a risk, but something, I have to remember the name uh, they use in the UN for the for the journalists, but um, something like that. So the person, the government knows that they are being, um, you know, that these people is not alone. Those people are not alone. And there are people somewhere um, monitoring what happened to that artist or that journalist or that, uh, you know, academic writer. And the other thing is um, to see how can we, break all these because Marco was talking about all this uh, internet and also on the TV sometimes they put bad things about artists and and explosive comments about artists um, and people you know so I think how can we create a system of verification of what they are saying about us and the artists or the journalists or the writers or the uh, maybe you know because even like Wikipedia for example my Wikipedia I cannot change it, and it has a few things that are not right. And they, they have people in Cuba just working on the Wikipedia of people. This is insane, you know? So I think how can we create maybe a database or a kind of Wikipedia style or whatever profile where people can go if they have doubt about who these people are and confront the truth, you know, about... These are two ideas. It's very useful. Thank you very much. I noted them down and just want to give the word to Marco quickly. Uh, Marco, you spoke poignantly about the risks you and fellow independent writers are facing. Uh, I wonder what gives you the strength to continue writing and um, what do you think the international community as well as younger peers can do to address this problem? Well, thank you. Um, well, uh, you, you see, I uh, got back to Serbia and this is because uh, at one point, uh, when they obviously realized that I'm making a big mess for them and uh, that uh, they're suddenly paying a price for uh, what are they doing to me, the campaign stopped. The campaigns uh, stopped. And uh, uh, there was, they, they, even though they stopped, uh, I was uh, uh, verbally attacked on the street uh, like three days ago. So I'm uh, uh, this, uh, I, I, I'm still uh, in, uh, you know, ungrateful situation, but uh, I really uh, had to uh, measure uh, should I uh, come back uh, for uh, uh, the election, the December elections, knowing that uh, we have another election uh, in the spring. Uh, and I decided, yes, I really had tough time. Uh, I was, I'm the only person from Serbia being re relocated in my case, yes, certainly was the worst uh but i really had a tough time uh, 
sitting abroad and uh, watching all my friends and colleagues, especially journalists, uh, uh, you know, uh, fight uh, and uh, for, for freedom of speech in Serbia. Uh, so I decided to, 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 to get uh, back here and, uh, you know, I have this uh, um, privilege, how to say, uh, to, uh, to know that I have certain steps uh, that I can make like tomorrow, day after tomorrow, to to get myself back into relocation. relocation. And the other and the others do, do not have that opportunity. So, uh, what we realized uh, from uh, my case and then later on from the case of the Professor Jovo Bakic, uh, uh, you know, when you uh, uh, get public with them, when Pen International makes a statement along with Pen Serbia. Uh, uh, and other pen uh, centers, they uh, they get quiet uh, because, as I said, we are still uh, the uh, member, uh, the the candidate for a membership in European Union. So uh, they need to measure their steps uh, too. But as I said also before, the situation can only get worse. So uh, you know, uh, I, I think the 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 the. Uh, international community must be uh, really not tough but uh, just uh, to serbian authorities they cannot uh, perceive serbian authorities as democratic and able to uh, act like they are uh, uh, like serbia is normal country serbia is not normal country anymore it's an autocracy with uh, shutdown media and the terror against uh, all those who speak up uh, ag uh, against or who criticize the regime so uh, we need a constant uh, uh, attention from abroad uh, to help us uh, get over this uh, dire situation. Uh, speaking of youth, I will be uh, short because uh, there is not uh, much to say to Serbian youth, having in mind that uh, Serbia suffered uh, uh, the, the two mass murders in three, uh, on three, 3rd and 4th of May day after day in 2023 and uh, almost 20 uh, kids and young people were killed by a kid and a young man so uh, you know we have a youngest mass murder in uh, in history in our first mass murder in history of serbia which was on 3rd of may in elementary school vladislav ribnika in the center of belgrade one pupil killed uh, uh, other other pupils and uh, and the guard, a school guard. So you know, it's a third. It was a thirteen. He was a thirteen-year-old killed kid at that moment. And uh, when you see, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what uh, what young people from fifteen to thirty years old uh, think about, uh, uh, they you will you will find out that they are extremely right-winged uh, uh, oriented this is because we live in a in a poor society in a deranged society in a society uh, which glorifies war criminals in a society that glorifies nationalism and uh, these young people uh, uh, do not have uh, actually the future in serbia but to participate in nationalistic and chauvinistic uh, uh, rampage uh, that, uh, that it's it's easier for a young i know what what it's like it's easier for a young uh, person uh, to 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 be a nationalist or a fascist even uh, than to try to be a democrat or to fight to to to, to even understand the democratic and liberal values uh, so uh, it's it's really embarrassing that these same uh, uh, young people, when you ask them, do they see themselves in Serbia? Almost eighty percent of them say they do not see their themselves in Serbia in the future. So uh, all of them are planning to flee uh, flee Serbia, but all of them are uh, at this point. Uh, Ex far right extremists so uh, i cannot talk to them uh, for, I, I i can only hope that, that there will be some changes in serbian society in serbian political climate they they can uh, uh, improve uh, the uh, you know the situation for future younger generations after after these kids uh, who are i'm afraid uh, lost because in serbia we had uh, more than 10 years of milosevic and the youth was uh, uh, were, were the ones who brought milosevic down including me uh, but now we have 12 years of aleksandar vucic and we have uh, and he obviously learned his lessons from history 
and mistakes from Milosevic and really, really worked a lot on, uh, you know, shutting down and uh, uh, the, the, the youth uh, possible, uh, the youth resistance. So we don't have, uh, you know, politically engaged the youth in, in right way, but only in extremely right way. I see. Thank you. That's a bit, bit of a gruesome thing, because I always imagine youth being more progressive, but unfortunately, in some countries, it's not. And we have to work perhaps to remind them of peers across borders that have the same issues and that maybe they should connect with others in similar shoes. Um, Matida, I just want to also present you with the youth question and also um, perhaps you can also address what Penn has done for some writers this year. Um, in, for example, our emergency support work, um, what we are able to do, but also I'm curious to hear what you suggest for younger people to do in Myanmar, but also internationally. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I, I'm really happy with the young people from Myanmar. Uh, right now, according to the st uh, statistics, I think at least 10,000 people were uh, put trial under the defamation law, Article 505, 505A, something like that. So the military regime has been taken so seriously, acting as a digital, uh, digital dictatorship, digital, digital tyranny, but the young people with the help of the technological knowledge, they are fighting for their rights, fighting for their chance to be free. That's why I it's reminded me the 10 years ago, one of my keynote speech, I wrote the creativity rests not in freedom, but in hunting for freedom. Creativity does not come from the freedom we have but the freedom we want to have. This is exactly what the young people in Myanmar is doing. With their own creativity, they are trying to combat both in, uh, in terms of the resistance, we're doing the hybrid one, the peaceful way and the, the armed conflict. So the, right now, the young people, you know, up to uh, a dozen of the uh news agency has been banned by the military regime but right now after three years we having more than three dozens of the digital new uh news agency something like that so it's by creativity with the help of the technology our population the the Burmese people especially the young generation they are doing with their own creativity to finding and hunting for the freedom, not with the freedom. We do not have the freedom. That's how I think this is also very uh, true to us the, as a writers, as a poets, as a kind of the creator. You know, I believe in creativity. It's not because of the freedom. It's just for the freedom we should fight. So in this case, I'd say, of course, we are not very successful in convincing uh, the, the authoritarian regime to release persecuted writers. Uh, a couple of handful cases we have gained in 2023. It's very, very little amount. Another issue is, you know, not all writers are in prison, even though we call our comedy writer in prison comedy. We are uh, facing a lot of writers at risk including myself, you know. So, so many writers are right now facing so much problem with the citizenship issue or something like the serious uh, demands for the relocation, etc. So, for the international community, pay much attention to what's going on in individual countries, you know. According to my experience in my own country, Myanmar, I think people just need the legal protection and legitimate uh, protection security, even though, you know, we, we don't want to leave the country forever. You know, we are just looking for a temporary refuge of freedom from the international community. In that case, what we were facing as a pan international in past two, three years, it's the humanitarian visa. It's very hard for some countries. It's very hard for us to convince issuing the humanitarian visa for some writers at risk, or even if from the some other part 
especially from the global south and there's some countries with the authoritarian regime it's very hard for them to even to get the humanitarian visa not even for applying the other uh, immigration status so I, I really want to alarm the international community pay much attention to these issues you know we are the creatives so we really want to get the freedom with the security without the sense of security freedom is just nothing that's why we want to have the respected sense of security from the international community that's what the international community should grant it otherwise only one solution is get rid of all the authoritarian regimes on earth with their, <laughs> with their effort, <laughs> international community, if they cannot get rid of all, every single authoritarian regime on earth, they just need to take care of the victims of these authoritarian regime by guaranteeing the legal support or the uh, other assistance. That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matida. I think that you outlined some very important points. Also, how we are facing the same challenges, our solutions might be the same in terms of raising awareness and having a louder collective voice can then spare us individually, I hope. Um, and I just want to go back to Fatina Algora very quickly, um, because you mentioned obviously ceasefire is the main most important thing to do right now. I am just wondering what is required from the international community after the war ends? Um, how can we prepare for that? Of course, we are wanting it to end as soon as possible. Um, but is there something we can do to prepare for the aftermath? What will be uh, awaiting writers um, in the region? And what can the international community do after the fighting stops? Visiting Gaza. Yeah. Visiting Gaza. Mm. Uh, writing po poems about Gaza. Uh, drawing uh, something uh, on the rubble of the, the destroyed houses. Uh, do, doing uh, musical uh, uh, concerts on the rubbles of the houses. Uh, making uh, festivals. Uh, cinema festivals uh, also between these uh, houses uh, or the, the ashes of the houses and this is uh, even what we did like uh, from time to time the Palestinian they are doing that up to this moment uh, in uh, the between the tent that they sleeping uh, in it uh, these days and uh, they they are doing uh, presenting some movies for the children so you can come support the people, uh, people bring them what uh, what um, shall rebuild the, this uh, city in a cultural way because Gaza one of the most cultural uh, city, uh, cities and also the people in Gaza they they are well known with their education with their uh, uh, reading and with their creativity actually so this is what I ask uh, all the people so, should go and visit Gaza and take uh, the hand of the Gazan people and say, yeah, sorry. Yes, I absolutely will. I think we will have a long history of trying to um, battle with this issue somehow with our peers. And so it will always stay on the top of our agenda. Um, and I think I have to just start slowly wrapping up, but I have uh, one last question for Tanya and Marco. Um, uh, I just wonder if you're facing these extreme challenges and still amidst these challenges you hold on to writing, to literature and to art in your lives. Um, what role do these practices play for you personally in your life to deal with these challenges that you're facing? I don't know. It's a way to, in, in my case, I, I, I am an artist and I use it as a way to transform uh, horrible energy into positive energy. I try to also see what can we learn from these experiences through my work. Um, I try also sometimes to, to, to put audiences in situation of a stress where they go through things similar or, or close to what we go through as a way to identify this when it happens to them. Because sometimes uh, repression, an oppression, um, unless it's a war, uh, can happen around you and you have been educated to support, to, to, to endure it, or, you, or the society has naturalized 
all this abuse or all these uh, restrictions and you don't see it. And this is also another problem we have sometime when we realize um, what is happening. If you are young, for example, what is happening to you when you're younger, maybe it's too late because already you have been targeted, you know? So I think it's important. Also, you the other question about the youth. In Cuba, everybody wants to leave the country, but um, it would be nice to see how can we teach in schools to young kids, like high school or whatever, um, classes where we teach them what does it mean to have freedom of expression? What does it mean to defend it? What does it mean? What um, elements we have to defend it? And, and why is it important? Because I think sometimes people don't even realize how important it is until it's too late, you know? And they silence you first as artists and writers who speak out. And if you are silenced, they don't hear about it. So I think we as the youth also need to get behind supporting cases of our elder peers and learning and training ourselves in how they combat. Because if we want to have free voices, we should look at people who are fighting to defend their free voices like you and Marco as well. Um, I'd like to uh, give you the same kind of question. Um, I can repeat it if you if you like or if you had a yeah, you noted it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, well, I, I have a writer's block. Uh, I have to be honest, uh, it's, it's quite impossible for me uh, to write a new novel. I had 10 novels so far published uh, and uh, they were written in far better times uh, than, than these. I wrote two novels uh, during this uh, autocrat autocratic regime and both are, uh, you know, politically engaged, uh, but uh, you know, I started writing a, a new novel in uh, autumn or the fall of uh, 2022, and then we were relocated. And believe me, it's impossible for me to be relocated and to and to be in such a, a situation and write a novel. Then I I I I, <laughs> I I'm already writing a daily column, but this is journalism, and uh, and I also record uh, and I recorded. For for all nine months, uh, I recorded every week uh, via Skype our podcast. Uh, so uh, you know, it's uh, it was. I was I'm I'm public personality since uh, 2004. Uh, so I started uh, uh, to be, uh, well, you know, well known or recognized uh, uh, in much better times. So in. 2012, when uh, Aleksandar Vucic became the first prime minister, but the ruler of Serbia, actually, uh, you know, wise among us could see already in, 20, uh, in 2012 what is going on and where are we going. So I was one of uh, those and uh, I immediately started uh, criticizing the, uh, his regime because this is actually uh, the regime of Slobodan Milosevic without Slobodan Milosevic, but with Aleksandar Vucic, and we will see where, where, where we'll get there. So it was either to fight and raise your voice or, you know, keep your uh, mouth shut and uh, write uh, Shalala novels. Uh, I, I don't know how to write those novels and I don't know how to keep my mouth shut. So uh, there was no question for me what, which will I choose. And I can only, you know, from time to time uh, wonder, uh, you know, what would be if I had 12 years uh, of peace and democracy in Serbia to write novels uh, which I would like to write. But, you know, I, I didn't have and I didn't have actually a choice. Uh, uh, so uh, when I got uh, back here, uh, writer's block uh, remained uh, and uh, I, I really try, but you, you're my colleagues, you, you know, uh, there is no forceful writing, you know, you, you need to enjoy it. I need to enjoy it when I write because otherwise it's not writing. So I'm waiting for the moment to enjoy my writing, to start writing again. At this point, I'm fighting. I think you raise a very, very important point. I also personally feel of writing poetry right now is a total block. Um, and in a way, even writing about cases ongoing feels somehow wrong because I feel I'm not trying to, you know, express my thoughts over what's going on. What's going on is important enough. And so this is an important question, actually. I was reading um, a text by uh, Camus uh, literally 70 years ago, and he was saying, 
uh, in the face of so much global suffering, if art insists on being a luxury, it will also be a lie. And I find this to be really compelling because right now, in a sense, do you feel we have a duty to use our skills to address this global communal suffering and not sort of fetishize it and not, uh, you know, make it exotic or put our voices as, look how beautiful I write about this subject. It feels wrong to me, but we must also encourage creatives to use their skills in favor of this. So perhaps I can ask, um, Tanya is an artist and then uh, first, and then if you would like to respond, any of you, please do also come in. Um, I'm just wondering how best to advise uh, young people or also just anybody in general who wants to use their creative skills uh, in support of such cases, but maybe they feel that they don't have a place. Um, they feel they don't know how to how to do that. Uh, I think one of the biggest um, dangers I see is people thinking that everything happens somewhere else. Mm. Yeah. Like. Uh, you know, in Berlin, they say, no, this will never happen here. It happens in Africa or, you know, or the United States say, no, it will never happen here. It happens in Cuba or in uh, Mexico. You know, so I think we need, um, we, I propose a book that was done by Artists at Risk. Um, and it was pretty fun because we interview a series of artists to, and I wish Marco was in there, um, a asking what were the, techno the techniques they used to eliminate freedom of expression in their country. And it was surprising how similar they were in every country, like how much uh, they use kind of the same techniques. So, so I think it's about that, about being conscious that freedom can be lost any minute. <laughs> like it's not a guarantee at all. You know, and it's not about what happened to others. It happens to you and, and you need to identify I see, I mean, I work with students, I also teach, and I see a lot of lack of uh, resources that students have to identify because they they feel something is wrong, they feel angry, they feel, but they don't know what to do with that. So I think it's... Uh, yeah. Absolutely. It's a very poignant question, even when I get asked from friends saying how they can join in. Uh, sometimes just a letter writing could be really helpful, because by writing a letter you take an active stance, you take on somebody's story, you know what's happened to them, now you can't ignore it. Um, but as for some, of course, people, the, because of fear of um, what they might face as backlash, but also fear of sounding the wrong way about things, they may refrain from um, just joining these campaigns. And that's why um, I will direct the next question to Fatina Algora, just to say that um, to people who may feel, as Tanya said, far away from such problems, they feel it won't affect them, but they also might be compassionate people, so they don't understand the context, but they might be well-intentioned, they want to do something. Um, do you have any advice for such uh, cases where they are far, but what would you urge them, to, or how would you urge them to uh, approach the issue? Of course, we know it's a human issue, but um, I just wondered if you have any advice. That would be so difficult. I'm, I'm not uh, that uh, good uh, at advising uh, people. I think the only thing that I can say to anybody, uh, um, go yourself and uh um yeah uh, inform yourself about about what's going on mm -hmm. teach yourself about what's going on don't take it from the media or this channel or that channel because um uh, it, it you will never get the, the 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 real truth if you follow only uh channels go follow your guts mm -hmm. follow your humanity actually and think just for one second that it's only because of luck that you are here and not there instead of that person who's suffering so just for one second put yourself in the other person's shoes but it's difficult to, to advise anyone especially right now especially when we we have issue we have a real issue any in, in, and I, I don't mean only palestine i mean the whole world that the humanity we have an issue in our humanity we need this is the time to to actually to to act to rescue our civilization otherwise we we shall return decade like centuries back and we have nobody to blame but ourselves 
because we didn't do what to, what's required to 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 help to help absolutely i think that's a really great and important point to get ended because these are the most pressing issues especially when people are being killed fought and war is raging and disease and famine i mean we're talking about much more urgent issues than we did five years ago and uh, we also share these problems uh, wealth inequality everywhere tax evasion is an issue everywhere corruption is an issue everywhere censorship is an issue everywhere that's right you are very much right that we need to do away with our less pressing disputes and really get together. We can argue again in ten years if things are better, but right let's now... argue. Let's argue. I wish <laughs> that we know how to argue because there is a lack of how to argue with someone. Do not be stubborn and this is what you believe. Listen to the other people. They have their own narrative yes. and their own narrative is solid also. So just give yourself uh, like a moment of breathing and listen just to the other people. Especially for the youth, because there's so much commotion and we are all shouting, we are all angry. But this case list is actually a good example because it offers us a chance to get together over the voices of these people who we are not uniting over an ideology or, or politics, but we are really having to, to talk to people who have spoken pr truth to power and who have found themselves in trouble. If we can get over them, then maybe we can get over all together. And I think uh, I really admire all of the efforts of the people in the case list and you you all for fighting for this we're trying to bring us all together in such a convoluted time and uh, I would like to thank you all for joining us uh, Matida, Anya, Marco thank you so much for your powerful accounts you will find uh, detailed information about the situation for freedom of expression in Myanmar Palestine Cuba and Serbia and other countries in our 2023 2024 case list Pen International is available to provide more information as needed I would like to encourage all our PAN members and supporters to promote the case list, to write about the cases mentioned in the report, keep them alive, keep them on the map, keep your eyes on them, as Marco said, and to keep highlighting their plight. Um, this year, the launch is accompanied by our call to action on behalf of five emblematic cases featured in the case list. These are Maxim Znak from Belarus, Gui Minhai from China, Galal El Bahiri from Egypt, um, collective of 12 writers held incommunicado in 2001 in Eritrea and Freddy Antonio Quezeda from Nicaragua. Please look them up and please take part in our campaigns. Uh, scores of writers have seen their situation improve in recent years thanks to Penn's work. Campaigns do work. Your voices does make a difference. Please consider becoming a friend of Penn International and help us support writers at risk. Thank you for taking part in this event and joining Penn International in the fight to defend freedom of expression and combat censorship globally. Thank you so much.